Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Dual Screens podcast, the Internet's number one indie developer interview podcast in the entire world, hosted by two people you've never heard of, probably. Over there in that other box, he's Andy Asimakis. How you doing, Andy? Steven. Yeah. We're, we're going to get, to quote the great Frank Reynolds, we're going to get really weird with it today. Oh, baby. I can't wait. This excites me. <laughs> going to get really weird. I, uh, th this, this, this one excites me. Uh, you've, you've been hyping me up all day for this, uh, so much so that I have, I still have a little bit of espresso left. That's right. Mm -hmm. I, I went with espresso tonight. So I, w I had the good, good tonight as it were, but ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, two pretty awesome guests here. We have Dan Adelman and Billy Basso from animal. Well, uh, yeah, the indie, <laughs> listen, Andy, you should probably do this introduction because you, didn't realize wrote, who you were talking I, to. I, I, I wrote it. <laughs> and no, no, no. Because you didn't realize who you were talking to. And I think that's a right, fun story. Right. No, 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 no. I'm just going to say it. And then ahead, people will it. connect to that. So Dan is, I wrote, indie game business and marketing man extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. That's right. appropriate. That's extraordinaire. For, right. For that human being. I and, extraordinaire. Yeah. We should put that on my, on my business card. Sounds, sounds absolutely. <laughs> I almost used the word illustrious. Oh, but then Billy good, used it recently. I used that, yeah. And again, yeah, so I was like, all right, it's <laughs> it's there. I'm not going to use it again. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And Billy, who is the creator of Animal Well, a game that even Billy has a hard time describing. I, I do. I'm like, that's the most stressful part about like this podcast. Best. It's like, oh, fuck, they're going to ask me about the about game. The game. <laughs> 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 well, that was the thing. I, I took a chance because I read the blog post on PlayStation blog and you were a little cagey with what this game is, like what you actually do in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do I reach out and be like, hey, do you want to talk about the game you don't want to talk about on this blog post <laughs> for like an hour ish? Yeah. And to my surprise, like you guys were back and I was super excited. But I, I, I want to lead things off with a question directed directly at Dan. Okay. Dan, Dan. Dude. Dan the man. How, who, Dan, who's worked on so many amazing games, you know, X, X, Xbox, X, Nintendo, super into indies now, you know, Chasm, Savior, former guest of the show as well. How do you, how do you market a game that even Billy can't, describe to the public is it just you let the weirdness speak for itself do you just tell billy come on give me something to work with <laughs> now, this was, so it, it's interesting because um a lot of developers not a lot but you know developers reach out to me from time to time and i'm i'm very particular about which games i choose to work on it's it's got to be some kind of game that i personally enjoy playing. So Billy sent me a build um, and I started playing it. And, <clears throat> you know, like, I think like most people, you start to form an impression like right off the bat. And my first impression right off the bat was like, okay, low res pixel art, you move left, right, and, you know, and jump and very simple gameplay. This has been done, I'm not sure this is going to be that great, but you know, I was playing it and it felt the controls felt really good. So I just enjoyed like walking around the world and exploring. And then as I was playing, I, you know, would find these little secrets that Billy had hidden throughout the world. Like, like there was like a little, like some vines hanging down over some small pathway. And I was like, can I go through there? And then that opened up a whole, area of the map that I didn't even know existed. And like, there were enough of those moments that I was like, this is really, really cool how there are just so many secrets sprinkled throughout the game. And, and you know, so there are some parts and, and you know, uh, so I told Billy that I would be happy to work on this with him because the gameplay was really fun. The exploration was really fun. And I was like, the biggest challenge we're going to face in like the marketing side of things is like, screenshots won't do it justice. Cause if you look at a, a screenshot, it's like, okay, low res pixel art indie game. Right. How many of those have we seen? Um, and even, you know, short video snippets don't do it justice because it's those moments where you 
kind of discover, like you have a hunch, like, I wonder if something's back behind there and you find that there is, your hunch was right. And, and it's like those moments that you're like, oh, this is great. I want to keep, keep going, keep exploring. And how do you capture that in a trailer, in a blog post, uh, in, in a video? And so, um, so, you know, Billy's been working on the game for over four years now, I believe, and, and Billy can speak to this far better than I can. Um, but it's mostly been, you know, just him working alone evenings and weekends. And um, and then I started working on it, what, about six months ago now? Six or yeah, eight like months? Maybe in June of last year? Something. So, yeah, about eight months now. Um, and we were trying to think of, like, all right, when should we really start talking about it publicly? How should we start talking about it publicly? Um, and... Um, yeah, and and so um, yeah, we we put together a trailer, um, um, and we um, we reached out to IGN, um, and IGN played through it, and they they got what was special about it, and so they put together a really good like four minute preview that I think really yeah, explains I saw that. what's magical about the game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, that was the big thing that you know Billy and I have been brainstorming for the last like eight months is how how do we get past just like the the normal way you show gameplay to people is like here's you know some sample gameplay footage and see if that's the kind of thing you're into and here's the graphics and it's like it you you really need to play it so we, we've got some ideas of how to communicate what's special about the game um but yeah it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky problem um <laughs> for a game like this uh, yeah. Billy, <laughs> now okay. we could e we could easily just say, hey, wh what is this game? Tell us about mm -hmm. it. What is it? Well, I don't want to do that to you, okay? I want to actually make okay. this a yeah. little easy no, for no, you no, because no, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, the, the IGN preview um, mm -hmm. actually did a really good job, I think, of um, hitting a few key gamer things. Uh, tickle spots as I like I like to call them right now that I just made that up mm -hmm. um Good job. Good just job. made it yeah, we, on we the, all, spot. the ga all, gamer yeah. tickle spots um as a gamer like one of the first things I remember about games like Zelda or you know whatever Castlevania or whatever are are like you said the secrets the discoverable uh aspects Mario had those too you know, discovering the warp pipe for the first time and all that stuff um and it seems like you took kind of what gamers have been training themselves to do for 35 years and you kind of turned it on, on its head a little bit um, with the mm -hmm. way you expect to platform and explore this map while you're looking for these secrets. So why don't you talk a little bit about what makes this different than your typical 2D pixel platformer where you you know get different platforming abilities because that's i think the the really mm -hmm. that's the selling point of this of this uh game yeah i think um i think there's i'm just like tired of seeing games do the same the same things over over and over again like um even just like in the genre of metroidvania is like every game you get a double jump every like every game now you get that midair dash move yeah um or you get a, a slide um and it's like it's like a very they're all fun actions that you do in those games but like um it's just i don't know I just, i'm just i see i follow a bunch of indie games like on twitter and stuff and that they're all just doing the same things they all have like coins to collect or um, it's like there's like a indie game starter kit that everyone seems mm -hmm. to seems to be doing with and, and i mean a lot of people would probably say that for for this game with like it being pixel art and in 2d or whatever but um i think I, yeah i just wanted to to create a game that i really liked playing so i was like pulling from genres i i liked like it's you know heavily inspired by like you mentioned zelda and castlevania and, and metroid and and like other puzzle games like fez um or, and then i also really like a, a lot of survival horror games so i'm like i'm like kind of doing the boring thing of just like taking all the parts i like from these games but then i'm trying to like always never just copy it directly and always like kind of give it a little bit of a, a twist. Um, and then like another thing I like to do, I think 
in when designing games like try to like teach like first of all have like as little tutorial as possible and so like the game is sort of um set up in a way where there's really not a lot of things to try and you can you kind of figure things out on your own just through experimenting um and you always like feel like you're figuring it out yourself and the game isn't like holding your hand um but then also like once once a player once a player feels like they understand how it works kind of like kind of like fucking with them a little bit and then <laughs> breaking your own rules like establishing the rules but then but then intentionally uh breaking them um like like one example is maybe you saw in in the trailer there's like this big there's like this big um, ghost dog thing um so like throughout the game every time you leave a screen it's kind of like uh if you ever played like vv vv um yeah where it's like you just move from screen to screen the camera never never changes um like every enemy you encounter they don't leave the screen every screen is kind of like its own puzzle so um you'll like be going from screen to screen and like sometimes things will attack you and and uh like the worst case scenario is you just have to like leave the screen and then you're safe um but then i wanted to like and then you could play the game for a couple hours and it's just like oh i just leave the screen and it's like never that scary but then i wanted to like introduce an enemy that like breaks that rule and starts to like continue <laughs> to follow you like and then just seeing something come from off screen just feels like very invasive and um and wrong and then you know there's like just like a lot of little things like that um i don't know it's like it's like a lot of subtle subtle things and i wanted to um also to try to try to create something that kind of had a, a slightly different style than what's been been done i didn't want to go like the straight like classic fantasy route or like try to avoid a lot of the cliches of of like sci-fi and fantasy that games games pull from and make something a little more surreal and um weird yeah so i just had to draw a bunch of animals so like that was the excuse for like it's a it's like a, a well or what appears to be a well that's filled with animals and maybe they're all maybe it's haunted i don't know <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's it, it's amazing how much space there's still left to grow like the traditional metroidvania genre because like you said like so many there's like a template for what this should be like mm -hmm. when i was playing bloodstained when it came out it was as if they hadn't learned from years of recent games in the genre it was just there was an idea that they were stuck to when and then they made it which was it was still great but it didn't mm -hmm. try to break what the genre should be and here you come along well there's a double jump well i'm going to shoot a bubble jump on that jump on a platform instead of a lantern i have this weird yo-yo light thing that also can press switches at the same time and it, I, I i like how you are sort of again you're turning the whole thing in its head the, the genre and items don't have just one singular function it's how can i make this one thing do a bunch of different things and it's like a giant puzzle box this thing is morphed into and and that's the beauty of it it's that discovery that you hardly find anymore in games yeah it, uh, it I, I just want to add to that if, if you don't mind but like mm -hmm. the 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 world that you drew and you created and in, in, in this game is very whimsical. And I feel like if you just had a double jump, a dash, a slide and a, you know, grapple hook or whatever, like it wouldn't match. Like that wouldn't mesh. Yeah, together. it wouldn't feel right. This, these abilities that you have add so much whimsy to it and it fits perfectly. It's like, it's like a, it, it fits like a glove, like seeing it, you're like, of course that's what of course that's what the yo-yo does <laughs> of course it does like yeah obviously that's what it's gonna do and uh i think that's really um that's really commendable because it's you don't always get both of them to match it's sometimes it's difficult to have the gameplay match the world in that in that very specific way why was that important to you why was it important to you to have to be different not just for the sake of being different Mm -hmm. But why was it important in your in your soul that you needed to? Because I could tell the way yeah, you're describing uh, it. It's like it's indeed. you needed to make this thing. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Why is that important um, to you? 
Well, I think like, first of all, well, just cause like, I'm, I like love games like this, but I'm also getting, getting a little bored of them sometimes. So I wanted to just make one, like see, see where it can go. But, but also I wanted for all like the items specifically in the game, um, like the initial idea was like, oh, can I, I kind of want to like, I started with like survival horror inspiration. First of all, I was like, can I make like a 2D survival horror-ish game? But like, but I don't want to like make it look like a horror game. They're always, they're always like, so, you know, like all the, just like the gore and um, just zombies and all the kind of classic monsters you'd see in a game like that. And I was like, I feel like a lot of people see that and then they just, they kind of disregard it and say like, oh, this is a game for me. Could I, but, but I loved like, um, you know, sort of the, the slow pacing and the, the sort of like in a Resident Evil game, you're kind of like, which is kind of like a Metroidvania. There's like, you're constantly just like unlocking doors and backtracking and right. um, there's like puzzles. Um, so I, I wanted to like kind of make a game that felt like that. Um, and, the, and then specifically for the items, like I, wa- I still like wanted like power-ups, but I wanted them to feel kind of, kind of kind of lame and like crappy like they didn't make you feel cool like um you don't you don't get a gun or like any magic abilities you get like a you get a you know a bubble a single bubble <laughs> not even like two bubbles um or like uh like in one of the other it's just like a frisbee they're like children's toys um that that like you you have to like try to maybe defend yourself with um or or like use them to your advantage but but you gotta like be creative about it it's not just obvious like that this will help you a lot what a i'm curious when when you're showing this off to someone like dan is the decision to quit your day job to do this full-time or does does it come from dan saying billy this is it quit your job this is the one stop Ah. what you're doing stop what you're doing and just focus i think it was more entirely (laughs) I think I was just like I don't I don't want to I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For the record, I I wouldn't just tell somebody like you don't need an income. You're fine. Just live for the art, man. Like, yeah. yeah. Now, fortunately, you know, Billy and I had been talking about it for a while. Like, um, he had built up a nest egg um, and was planning before we even met. He he was planning on, I think, like working through the end of last calendar year and then starting for this year, just quitting your day job and finishing. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's that was the plan, uh, I think, that you yeah. had set in mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 there wasn't, um, it was kind of inevitable. I was, I was, it was like my goal and it was just a matter of like, um, of when um, and like how, how long would I have to work on the game? But yeah, I always wanted, I was like getting more and more distracting working on this game while having a day job. I was like, I was getting more and more excited about it. So eventually I just like had to focus on a hundred percent. Well, um, when, like, when so. you have Dan vouching for your, for your project that you've been working on yeah. for three and a half years at that point, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I would get a little excited about it too. <laughs> yeah. I really think you're overstating my influence. No, I mean, I was, <laughs> This is making was, me uncomfortable. I was so excited. I'll make you more uncomfortable. I was so excited to start working with Dan. Um, oh, like, like he was the 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 one and only person I reached out to. Um, it was kind of like my my top pick for like I need somebody to like do business stuff for me because I <laughs> I like I'm just terrible at like reaching out to people. Um, and I like heard him on a couple podcasts and knew he worked on Axiom Verge and Chasm and those were both games that I like I really respected and um, and he works on like a bunch of Metroidvania so I'm like oh I'm kind of kind of making a game like that maybe he would like my game um so and yeah I reached out to him and, and here we are so is, it was that like here's my mixtape like how does how does how does that work with gaming? Like <laughs> here here's here's my thing please let me know if you like it okay bye like how does that I yeah, it was kind of, I, I remember like writing, writing the email. I'm like, okay, I got to put some, I read like a, I think I read like a Gama Sutra article or something about like how, how to, how to reach out to press or, or so like send a, send out demos. It's like, you got to put a good GIF 
in there. So I put three good gifts. <laughs> you got to like get to the point quick. You got to um, don't, don't undersell yourself or apologize. I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the perfect email. Um, and then like with all, with all these tips I've learned, done my research and then, and then Dan, Dan fell for it. Um, <laughs> got him. Like, he liked it. Yeah. Nailed him. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I didn't feel like I was being pitched. And in fact, I think like you described the game, if I recall correctly, and you were like, would you like to work on this? But you didn't include like a build. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would, could you send me a build? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I guess I, I, I messed up the, the I can't really part. tell if I, yeah. <laughs> So that was, that was, that was an important missing ingredient, but yeah, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a build like ready at that point, but then you responded. I was like, fuck, I need to, I need to make the game playable. So <laughs> I, like, I, scrambled, I scrambled for like a week or two to like kind of tidy it up a little bit. And then I sent it over. And that's when you apologize in the email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, I do think it's, it's, you know, going back to the first point that I made about how, marketing a game like this can be such a challenge is that like you know the the gifts that billy put together in the screenshots like they look good um but i was like i don't get i'm, I'm not sure i i'm convinced that this is going to be anything special just from those and it really took me playing it to to see like you know and like within like a couple minutes i was just like oh this game is awesome it feels great um there's tons of things to discover. And so like, I got it within minutes, um, but I actually had to pick up the controller and, and start it up and, and play it. And um, so, you know, we, we um, so Billy wrote a, a blog post for the PlayStation blog. And the way that that happened was, you know, I've done a lot of work with Sony over the last, you know, seven or eight years. And I know a lot of the people over there. And so I sent it to them and, and I was like, you got to check out this new game that I'm working on. And, um, and I was like, don't just look at the screenshots like that, I, that I'm including in the email, very similar email to what Billy sent me. I was like, here's a build, play it. And, and they did. And then they were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll include it. And we're doing this indie promo thing. And, you know, in, in January, so, or February or whenever, um, so we can include you in that. And so they've been very supportive and we've talked with them about, cool things we can do to make it really, you know, as good as it, you know, as much of a PS5 game, uh, you know, ironically enough, like, you know, PS5, you think like next gen hardware, um, and this is a 2D pixel art game, like such a big mismatch. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things that were, you know, because of Sony's interest in the game, um, we're, we're now starting to think about like, how could we make it even better for the PlayStation 5 platform. Um, so yeah, so that that was exciting. So I think one of the ways that, um, you know, getting back to the marketing angle, which is kind of what I think a lot about is, you know, I think at some point we're gonna have to have some kind of demo or, you know, if hopefully like events like PAX will be safe to attend and so we can get more people actually getting their hands on it because, um, yeah, you, know, you really need to play it to to get it. Yeah, and going back to that blog, I recall seeing a little thing about pushing the PS5 hardware not to its limits, but like really pushing it. And then you look at this game and you say, "How is these? Are these two D sprites pushing any hardware?" any limitations ever in any reality? <laughs> Yeah. So can um, you can you like expand on that a little bit? I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. So so right now I'd say like like I've been sort of developing this. First of all, I like made the engine for the game as well. So I've been sort of like the the visuals of the game have sort of been evolving as I've been just working on it because I'm like kind of adding new rendering systems on top of it, like on top of it one by one. Um, and just like in the past year. It's doing a lot of like a little subtle things. First of all, like like all the backgrounds in the game, they all have like normal maps. Um, there's a lot of dynamic lighting with shadows um, being cast. Uh, there's like a fluid sim. There's a Navier Stokes uh, 2D fluid sim running like at all times, just like a full screen. And um, you can I can just like draw sprites into it, and um, they get like infected 
uh, through the fluid field at any point. Um, so I can do use that for like smoke and fluid effects, like, uh, um, and I can make them look like very good. It's like normally something a lot of a lot of games like wouldn't bother doing, but but the way I think of it is like like it's a two D, it's like a pixel art game, and like the resolution is like pretty. It's like a not even a, is it pixel art, but it's like pretty pretty chunky low res pixel art. It's like three three twenty by one eighty. Like most pixel art games are are higher than that. Um, but like, if you take like a computer that is meant for 4k, you have like, and it's trying to render like a 4k image, which is like, you know, so much bigger. And I did the math and you can literally fit 144 like windows of my game on a 4k screen. Oh, um, <laughs> if, you, if they're all just like actually running a native resolution, um, but then you think like, oh, you have 144 times more computing power per pixel. So you can make that pic each pixel like perfect and you could do whatever you want. You could do like all sorts of exotic rendering techniques that would be, you know, only for like offline rendering or, or something. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of possi possibilities and potential I think to explore. Um, I'm not saying I'm like reaching that potential yet, but like that's sort of my guiding philosophy is like okay you can you can kind of if you like pixel art you can do use the computer however you want like the ceiling's so much higher um and then there's the added like artistic challenge of of making it look cohesive and um like if you come up with a new if i make a fluid sim like you want to still make it look like it fits in with with like the chunky blocky aesthetics and Kind of, you have to like be a little creative with how how you render things ultimately. Um, but I, yeah, that's sort of my approach right now. Yeah, some of those like the water reflections completely blew my mind. It's like oh, I'm okay. sitting here playing the FF7 remake, and I can't get a cloud reflection in a mirror in a bathroom. <laughs> and then here in this pixel art game, there's this giant horse water thing, and there's like these beautiful reflections. I'm like. This one guy did it <laughs> on oh, his own. <laughs> just... I I have a question here, Billy. Um, okay. You, uh, first a statement. You had a job that you left to finish this, mm -hmm. and the the thing you're making is a freaking PlayStation game. <laughs> How, yeah, how cool is that? It's very cool. <laughs> like, yeah. we, we sometimes, you know, we've interviewed cl close to 300 developers. And, you know, I would say a good, I don't know, 60% of them are just PC exclusive. Then you have your Xbox, whatever. <clears throat> but there's something magical about a Nintendo platform and a PlayStation platform. The small developers, especially solo devs, they're just they go nuts over the fact that they're, they're going to see their game on, on the system they grew up playing. What was that like for you? Like having, oh. having Dan come in and be like, Oh yeah, I spoke to fucking PlayStation and yeah, your game's going to be on it. Yeah. <laughs> it was su super exciting. Um, yeah, I wasn't that it's, yeah, it's been like a dream to, of mine to like release a console game, even though I've worked in a bunch of studios, it's always been on PC and uh, mobile um coincidentally so i was like i still like really just wanted to release a console game um and i had to i had to quit my job to do it <laughs> um but but yeah it's super exciting and then like playstation 5 like um i think out of all the all the systems so far their their storefronts like the most empty uh mm -hmm. so like I, I you can actually go see animal well like on the like near the top of the new new upcoming games list now it's like it's extremely exciting just seeing seeing it there yeah, i didn't right. need to I didn't need to search for it. I didn't need to type in the name. I just like opened up the, I just turned my console on and and, and saw my game. Um, it was awesome. Did you just sit there and stare at it for like a good ten minutes? Yeah, I just I just sat down on the couch, <laughs> and then and then because the PlayStation menu music so like relaxing, it's it like very very, relaxing. very tranquil. So um, yeah, it's very meditative. Uh, just looking at the <laughs> looking at the game icon um, and listening to the PlayStation menu music. You know, I do want to ask a more broader question to both of you. I'll start with Dan first. We're um, 
speaking about PlayStation, you mentioned also Xbox and Nintendo, Stephen. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of chatter with acquisitions all over the place lately. Dan, ha- having worked with Xbox, Nintendo, and now with Indies specifically, what are your thoughts when you see like the big AAA space getting a little bit smaller as like the months go by? What's that like for you? I'm just curious. So- so it's not so much the acquisitions in and of themselves that mm-hmm. is I, I concerning is probably too strong a word, but like I the direction, I think the reason we're seeing all of these acquisitions is this change in the overall business model from premium games where you see a game, you want the game and you buy the game, to a Netflix style subscription model like the the Game Pass model. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um Xbox is clearly seeing a lot of success and and stickiness to that model. A lot of their subscribers um, are just re-upping and renewing um, time and again. And so they need to feed the beast um, with more and more content. And what better way to do that than to acquire some great studios that will just churn out some of the stuff that you know those players are going to want and they're going to, you know, pay their subscription fees for. And... um, so I think that model makes a lot of sense for the platform owner. It is also, you know, to be honest, a great deal for consumers. Um, they pay, they probably wind up spending less per year on their subscription than mm. they would if they bought like three games individually, three AAA games anyway. Right. Um, where I personally get a little bit concerned is like, how does that affect smaller games? Um, mm. Especially if right. you've got... Um, just a few dominant platforms and you know um yeah and, and um where they kind of own the platform they they own this this kind of subscription service and you are just one piece of content that um for all intents and purposes they could take or leave like it, it'll be nice for them like you know let's say you know axiom verge um is another game that i worked on and um it for I think almost a year after it launched on the on Xbox One, it was the top rated game by um, by players in terms of like the five star rating system. So not in terms of sales, not in terms of like number of reviews, but like average review score. It was number one for like a year. Um, but still, I don't think you know. If you know when we're talking about a subscription service, like that's not what people are going to you know decide. All right, I'm going to spend a hundred bucks, or I, I don't even know what a Game Pass annual subscription is. I think it's mm-hmm. about a hundred. Um, um, they're not looking to see well is Axiom Verge on that list. It's that's they're more looking like is Halo right. on that list? Is mm-hmm. you know is Call of Duty on that list? Um, so I do wonder about you know the leverage that smaller developers will have. Um, when saying like, you know, the only way to reach consumers, because consumers are like, I don't want to pay for any more games because I already paid for the subscription. So if it's not in the subscription, I'm not playing it. Um, And so then you have to say like, all right, what will you give me to be in your subscription? And -hmm. and you kind of have to take whatever they're offering. Um, So that does worry me. I don't think we're seeing the effects of that too directly right now, but three or four years from now, it, it could be pretty material. Like the the amount of revenue that, you know, games generate from direct sales to, to consumers might wind up being a small fraction of the total dollars, um, you know, transacted on a game. Yeah, and like with Game Pass especially, I feel what they have a really stellar lineup of indie games that go to their platform. It's never about selling you on the game itself. It's more about we're selling you the service. Here's 10 great indie games. We're going to launch day one on our platform, $15 a month, go nuts. PlayStation is more, we're going to secure this one single game for our platform that we're going to focus on and market. So you want to play this game specifically. So it's two very different, like, methodologies when it comes to that the indie scene i guess in that in that respect with those two yeah yeah for for now and i think um as 
consumers kind of vote with their wallets about which mm -hmm. model they like better and which is more profitable. I could totally see like if if Game Pass really seems like that's the way it's got to go, I can totally imagine Sony pivoting and, and doing that. Um, I do think culturally Nintendo and and I you know saying this as someone who worked there for nine years, I think culturally Nintendo will have a hard time with the notion of lumping all of their games together and selling an all access subscription to it. Mm -hmm. Like you like they finally go, got over that hurdle for NES and Super NES games. Like they're like, okay, fine. We won't sell them a la carte anymore. We'll pay, you know, one price you get access to all of that whole library. <laughs> but man, there was a lot of resistance because they're like the original legend Legend of Zelda is fucking gold. We're not, that doesn't belong, you know, don't put baby in a corner or whatever the thing is. It's like each one of those deserves its own special treatment, which, mm -hmm. you know, as, as someone on the developer side, um, I very much appreciate that philosophy of like, you know, this game is something that, you know, a developer um, has poured their heart and soul into. They've risked their livelihoods to create, you know, like there's so much blood, sweat, and tears put into every game. And just to have it like, yeah, just put it in the pile with everything else and, mm -hmm. you know, pay one price for the month and you can, you can get, you know, there's a million other games just like it in that pile. Um, cheapens things a little bit mm. um so that that's that's my concern about yeah. that direction yeah, yeah it's could... yeah go ahead billy oh sorry yeah i just like wanted to sort of add to that specifically regard from animal well because like i'm I, I have like the similar similar concerns but even before i even knew about game pass and years ago um when i was making animal well like a big a big part of one another big part of the design philosophy is I wanted to make a game that was sort of a reaction to like the increasing trend of like games as a service and um, you know games kind of launching kind of incomplete and being patched constantly um, and like games on like older consoles you can like if you have a copy of it you can just put it in your system and it's like the complete game and it works and if like there's almost there's little point of having like a a PS4 game on disc um, and trying to like put it in a console like 10 years from now because if, if the servers are offline, you're going to get like the day one fucked up, broken version <laughs> of the ship. Um, and it's, it's going to like look for its day one 1.01 patch and it like won't be able to find it. So who, know, who knows what you're playing? Um, so I wanted to make a game that is definitely like complete um, from, from the beginning. Um, and not only that, but like kind of front load what would what most studios would treat as like downloadable content like post-release and like kind of just have that tucked in the game already but just as like more secrets to find um and even make it make stuff like so so obscure that it might take it might take years to figure it out and to to get to sections of the game but um that that's kind of like from like a marketing angle that's like like a delayed release of content but also i think just knowing something like oh you bought even if if we do a physical version i would love if we did we haven't really gotten to that point yet but like you have this game on your shelf and it, it has like things in it that you don't know about and um maybe nobody knows about yet um and it's just like this special artifact um that has stuff in into it so that's like kind of I'm trying to I'm trying to also create that experience as well, like long term with Animal Well and treat it treat it as something that feels timeless and like um it has a lot of layers to it. Yeah, I'll feel bad when folks pop in their cyberpunk discs many, many years from now <laughs> and it's like missing a 50 gigabyte update of, yeah. a, of a of a now functioning game. 92 <laughs> gigs. 92 gigs. Andy. Oh good lord. It's 92 oh. gigs and it's actually downloading right now. We're here. Good to Lordy. check that one out. Oh, um man. Dan, a quick question for you. Um when when you're pitched a game and you love the game and you're like, oh yeah, I want to work with the game. Um I you know I want to put my name behind the game or whatever. Um how important is the real is work is the person that make that's making the game and the team that's making the game have you ever had to walk away from a game because you just didn't 
couldn't really connect with the people making it because I could see that Billy, the huge nerd that he is and just how just passionate and just look at, look at his eyeballs. Like he's got a whole world just, <laughs> co- he's creating right now, just listening to us. And I could see how you could be like, yeah, absolutely going to work with, with, with Billy. There's no, no, no doubt in my mind, but how does that, how does that go for you when you're picking and choosing where you're going to go? And then how did it go with, with Billy specifically? Yeah. Um, that that's super important. Um, I've been lucky and, and, and I think the whole field of like indie game development tends to attract the kind of people I would like to spend time with and hang out with anyway, like creative people who are really interested in making something new and not just cookie cutter and, and not just like, you know, Hey, I found this niche, you know, this un- underserved niche um in the market so i'm going to design a game specifically for that even though i don't really like that kind of thing you know there's there's none of that it's always like some passion project and that that comes through um i have you know i i don't want to name names it's it's really only happened a handful of times where i was like talking to somebody and i was like you know i just don't think i can work with this person because like they're not open to feedback they're not Mm. interested Mm. in like um the things i'm interested in their motivations are all wrong and they're you know just being kind of you know stubborn about things and and so um yeah i there's there's only one there's one developer in particular i'm i'm thinking of and i i don't want to name any no no no, don't yeah that's not what what the game is but um yeah it's just you know we didn't gel and and so i was like this this isn't um, a good fit, but usually if somebody's making um, a really interesting game, they tend to be really interesting, genuine people. So I, you know, I um, am also working right now on a game called Savior. Um, um, oh, and, um, uh, we know, we know Savior. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you know Savior. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We've we so, spoken to Weston. <laughs> yeah, Weston is just a really good guy, and and so like, um, and. And, um, you know, Tom Happ is, is a great guy. Um, James Petruzzi from Chasm, great guy. So like so many times, like when talking with them, you know, we're you know, ostensibly on some kind of business call where we're talking about like, all right, what's our marketing plan for the next month. And then we get sidetracked and we talk about nerdy stuff and, and then we're yeah. like, oh crap, we, you know, we should get back to like talking about work stuff. Um, so it's, it's been great. Um, yeah, I, my my experiences with indie game developers just in general um has been far more positive than negative mm. and i would i will say that so going way back in in my history like um i started the indie business at nintendo and um when i started it, it was we wear um oh boy there was yeah going way back yeah, um, yeah so um, and back then, indie games weren't really a thing. Like, like it wasn't a mainstream part of the industry. And I remember as I was trying to figure out, like, what you know, what do we want to accomplish with this newfangled digital distribution? Like, no discs. What's that going to be like? And you know, and you know, what can we do with it? And I really wanted to see, like, can we use this as a mechanism? to encourage more creativity in game design. Um, And this was before I knew really any indie game developers. And at the time, casual games were a really big segment of the industry. So like match three, you know, bejeweled style games and all their clones. And, And so I would wind up talking to a lot of those developers. And those were kind of the opposite of what indie developers are, even though, you know, they were small teams making small games. Their motivations, I thought, were way too commercial. Like if if there was a game that was successful, everyone just rushed to clone it and make it, you know, just, you know, our games is just like this one, but with cupcakes instead of jewels. Or it's like, it's like, come on, guy, you know, break out. There's got to be more ideas than that. Um, and um, yeah, and that's how I wound up kind of finding the indie scene back when it was, you know, somewhat underground um, because they had no outlet. There was no way to sell their game. So it was a bunch of hobbyists making really 
creative stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got involved with it. And all those people, their value systems and their, you know, the way they look at games and what they respect about the, the art form of game design very much aligns with my own perspectives. Uh, I don't want to stroke the egos too much in this space. It's been, you know, a little bit already too much, but uh, I think I have to say it to both of you, you have to know how vital the two of you are to the industry. Dan, for just being a megaphone to games like Billy's who need to be seen and played by as many gamers as possible. And then Billy for doing something actually different in, in the industry. I mean, I was reading up on the blog, you were saying how your approach to games, is, this game is like, it's layered. And there's like a fourth layer of just the stuff that only you know, and no one else is gonna yeah, know. That's my like, game. It just, it's your own personal game within the game, like all the secrets. And it's your, it's your mission to have people unlock things and find things years from now. And no other game has that as a goal because things are just spelled out. There's a guide, there's a fax, there's a, there's like a, a, a data mine that spills all the things. And you're just like, I'm tr I want to capture that magic of that games had years ago. And it's, that is important. So important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think. I think a lot of games do, they do, some games still do capture it, I think. Um, but I, I don't think anyone makes that their main, their main mm -hmm. goal anymore. Right. Um, like, I, I was thinking, it's like, okay, the problem is the internet is like, it's very fast. Like, mm -hmm. you, you take like yeah. thousands of people and they, they'll, all, they'll all just pound on it and, and figure things out and they'll make a wiki and put everything out there. So it's like, okay, how do you, and then, and then if it if they can't figure it out, they'll like data mine it. They'll like they'll decompile the code, and then they'll mm -hmm. like read through it, and then they'll like they'll figure it out that way. Um, and usually, like that gets that defeats like all games out there, um, unless you do enough, you patch something in later. Um, but I was like, okay, well, there you could actually solve that if if you really wanted to make that a goal. Like there's. Like we don't, we still have encryption and like people do banking like securely and there's right. still ways to hide things from people <laughs> if it's like a serious problem. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually planning on like a lot of the stuff in Animal Well will be encrypted <laughs> until oh, you- Oh like, yes, that's, that's, really, really, that's really incredible. Be, you solve the puzzle <laughs> to like <laughs> so cool. decrypt the data um, like BitLocker style. Um, and also to even add, add another layer to that like like people could probably still like they could probably run it in a debugger and inspect the state of the registers and stuff to like um not if it breaks start. their machine <laughs> but but yeah like so modern modern computers now like anything that's like x86 based or even the switch like they have um encryption just like built into the processors like hardware encryption like aes um like just it's in the circuit like you can't even like it just does it in the in the circuitry and you can't even like there's no software angle to break into it um so that's that's like also something i'm, I'm looking into and take taking it very seriously <laughs> clearly figure, figure the secrets out <laughs> all right well figuring speaking of figuring the secrets out it's now time to get some secrets out of the two of you Okay. Oh boy! Oh, right. the time has come. It has. It, it was actually a while ago, but we that's all right. We've been talking, and I've and I've been enjoying the conversation. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll try and make it quick. It is now time for rapid fire. It's everybody's favorite segment of the show. It's really the only segment of the show uh, <laughs> where we're going to ask you <laughs> a bunch so, of so ridiculous. very <laughs> random, very off the cuff questions. And uh, we're going to get your answers. And, and usually when we have multiple guests, we like to like do th this or that or who would rather or blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'll start off. I'll get it's just the it's a simple yes or no question. We'll see where you guys stand on this one. Is cereal a soup? Mm. I'm going to go with. I'll take yes on that one. 
Mm. I'll take a guess on that one. Okay. I'm going to say no. Mm. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. We, we got him warmed up now, Andy. Mm. Now hit him with the penis right. questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm saving that for the game pitch. Oh right right later. right. right, right. <laughs> okay. got it, got it, got it. I have my design document <laughs> sent to Dan as soon as the call is over. <laughs> <laughs> um, Billy, if Dan were a professional wrestler, what would his name be? Ooh. Um. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is oh, you really got me here. <laughs> And the same out question out for Dan. My, so Dan's got some time to consider the answer. Dan, same question to but you. You get some. You get All some right. lead time. <laughs> I think. I think it would just be Dan. It'd be like really simple. Just Dan. Just Dan. Yeah. 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 Dan in yeah. his hoodie, just walking <laughs> to the ring. It's like, is he the cameraman? That, like, that, who is that, that guy? Would be like his gimmick. Is he's like the the everyman wrestler. <laughs> oh, I love it. The couch potato. Uh, <laughs> just wiping like your really fingers on your, on your sweater. Like, All right, yeah. I guess we gotta do this. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't. You, you're. You wouldn't be able to use your last name though. Yeah, <laughs> always, I always have to keep it. In no, well. no, you, you could, you could <laughs> cross off the first letters and just be Dan Man. Just <laughs> here comes Dan Man. <laughs> I wonder if he's gonna win this match, and it's over. <laughs> it, Dan came in gimmick today to the podcast. He did. Those, he did. He did. <laughs> what Dan. would you? What would you? What would you name Billy Dan if Billy were a professional wrestler? What would you? Oh man. Um, mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe we'll go with the wizard. Because here's mm-hmm. my thinking. Like, mm-hmm. I no offense, Billy, but I, I, yeah. I don't think your strength uh, stats would be on par with the other professional rev, uh, wrestlers. Yeah, so really, like, what is really the opposite big. of an equally powerful, like, high int, low strength mm-hmm. character? Mm-hmm. That would be a wizard. Indeed. So... Okay. Something like that. I don't know. It's a reasonable, reasonable answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more of a low strength, low int kind of guy. Just so. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all cha. I'm all cha, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I got literally nothing else. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like a water balloon with, with a smiley <laughs> face. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, if you, Billy, mm-hmm. what is your desert island video game oh interesting um it would be something like something I'm, i don't have the patience to play right now um it would be like i don't know like one of probably one of the final fantasy games some rpg that that i stopped playing after like 40 hours but i know i could play for like 500 hours yeah um yeah let's just say final fantasy 7 because i have never actually finished it it's like a game I'll always gets like oh. near at the end of disc one and then and then stop <laughs> that, <laughs> but i've done that like i've done that like three so much more games. game left <laughs> i know yeah so i need i need to be on a different island to finally um, to finish it right, finish it yeah <laughs> It would be a new game, so yeah, it would be a game I haven't finished. Uh, Dan, if indie games were outlawed, Ooh. what would their street name be? So you're like the guy with the trench coat walking down the alleyway, see a couple of people, yeah, I got the new so and so. Maybe uh, Nerd Crack or something like that. <laughs> nerd <laughs> Crack. <laughs> I think it's I got think so many so other good. meanings, possible meanings. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. If you could pick one era in gaming to make a game, a brand new game for right now, what era would you pick? This is for both of you. You could work. You're a team. You're working on this together. Hmm. I feel like I would like to make. I I want to make like a new Virtual Boy game. Oh, something with like that's still two D, but it's like the best. It's like 
the, it's like peak 2D before it went out of fashion. Um, Did you just use the best in the same sentence as Virtual Boy? Yeah, I mean the Virtual Boy is like the it's like the <laughs> successor to the Game Boy. Uh huh. Um, but it's like 32 bit. It's got a really is it? You don't know. Screen. You don't know, Steve. But I have a Virtual Boy right here. I know you do. Me. I know you do. In my glass. In my glass. The Virtual camera. Boy has like some of the best art of Mario characters. If you mm -hmm. look at the sprites from like Mario Tennis, like you don't get to see them looking that way anymore. No, Wario because game. if you look too long, you will go blind. <laughs> you you can also like you can just like play it on an emulator with a, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really care about the VR the VR part of it. It's, uh, Dan, how the hell are you marketing also, a, uh, a a virtual boy game? <laughs> Yeah, no, that that would be, that would be a tough sell. <laughs> I'd probably pass on that game. <laughs> oh, Do you on. like the color come red? On. Red. But what red. if it reinvented the color red in some remarkable yeah, way so that only this <laughs> game could do? Do you like Spina Bifida and leaning yeah. over your table? Yeah. What if it offered LASIK? You know, while you were <laughs> playing the game. Do you think Virtual Boy would be any better if they picked a different color? Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. I do. I don't know. Because red was the cheapest. Right? Red, the red cheapest. is so like aside from the fact that it was it was dark and it was difficult to real. It, it's aggressive. Red is an aggressive color. It makes you want to fight someone. Creativity. It inspires children. anger. Is what it inspires. Yeah, you're, you're in hell. <laughs> you're literally just... Like I mean, it's better than the puke green of Nintendo's past, but like. I don't know. I feel like a blue would have been mm. nicer. Oh, yes. Mm. Blue light kind of hurts your mm. eyes, right? I don't know. They've done research. Nintendo's real smart about things like that. Um, don't, don't blue lights like... Like, they were, like, hanging up blue lights in I I one of some European country, and it was like to, like, reduce crime because blue, like, calms everyone down, and oh. if they're about to commit a crime, the blue light stops them. Well, that's science. Yeah, so... Maybe, maybe blue. You know, if we all just had some more nerd crack, we'd all be a lot more calmer. So we need less <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> you, You've been on the internet lately, haven't you? Have you, have you seen my nerd crack, Stephen? It is. <laughs> have you seen Reddit? Uh, Boy, do I have a fucking story for you. Dan, what is the dumbest way you've ever injured yourself? So, uh, well, all right. So one time... Um, uh, in uh, grad school, um, I was actually living in Japan, and and there was this kind of hangout area where all the students would, uh, in the department, would just hang out and read comic books and do their homework, and and there was a basketball hoop with like a Nerf basketball, and and so I was playing goofing around with some friends, and I went to like slam dunk it, um, like Michael Jordan style, mm -hmm. and I came down and I broke my ankle because I landed wrong and um I got very little sympathy from the other students like when I came <laughs> back the next day on crutches with like a cast and they're like you broke your ankle playing like the the, the nerf basketball game like that. It was so pathetic and, when are you transferring uh, out of the school <laughs> yeah right uh, so like I would tell people like you know you know, when people ask, how did you break your ankle? It's like, ah, oh, slam dunking a basketball. I left out the word nerf, mm. you know, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm all, I'm all a fan for revisionist history. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm all about it. <laughs> Andy, I've got an interesting question here. And then I think we'll, uh, we'll, all, we'll let you, aren't, you'll, aren't we'll let you uh, uh, question us out. Um, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so this is, the, this is for both of you. We're going to alternate. Um, so, I'm going to start with Dan. Dan, what is one thing, one thing that Billy has taught you since you've started working with him? There's, there's actually a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of like one thing. I think um, probably it, it's, it's, it's hard to like pinpoint as a thing, but I think the, overall game design philosophy like he'll just bring up some points of like ideas that he's planning on putting in the game and there's lots of moments where i'm like i would never have thought of that and so i think it's just all of those moments trying to you know kind of get a perspective into 
how he's approaching the design of the game. So, um, so yeah, I would say probably that just learning, a, you know, a very different creative direction than, uh, than what I've worked on before. Okay. Uh, Billy, same question. Um, I feel like, I feel like I've learned a lot. I'm just like, kind of how to talk to people from Dan. And he's like led by example. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. He's just like, he's very friendly and, and, and charming. And I'll like see him just like send an email to someone that I would have been like, so intimidated to talk to. And, and he's always just so nice. And then I'm like, like, Oh, you could, it's okay to be nice to people or like, <laughs> or like, yeah, they being they a dick like all this time has just not been working. I don't know what you're off. They like that. It's like mm-hmm. that's what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also, no, just like I think just that, and um, yeah, he, he also he's just like has so much so much experience just in games in general. Like he kind of uh, defies the stereotype of of just like the business marketing person that is sort of at odds with the creative vision of, of the project. And it's like meddling, but he doesn't meddle at all. And he's like a great, great collaborator. Um, so just, I don't know. I don't, I, I couldn't imagine um, just being, being, I feel very lucky. That's all. I don't know. And I'm not really saying what I've learned from Dan. Well, I did a little bit, but um I've just learned that Dan Dan exists and he's great. <laughs> and I think that's Dan, fair. That, pe- that people can be as good as accurate. Me. You know what? Just accurate. write him an email later. You could tell him later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, you're allowed to be nice. All right, Andy. <laughs> now the gloves are off. It is time oh, man. for the final question, the most difficult question either of these just... gentlemen will ever be asked, ever, period. Um and I'm real excited to know the answer here. Can we just talk more about this blob game for like another three we, hours? We can, but <laughs> we still need to know the answer. You're, we're still going to get here, so you might as well ask it now. Rip the Band-Aid off. Very important All question. All right. All right, gentlemen. It's the question Here's, that a lot of people are afraid to ask, but yeah. not us. Not the hard-hitting journalists here at Dual Screens. All right? Really we, building it up. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're like, we're on the front lines here doing the... Bombs are going off, and we're about to ask it to I'm just you. Gonna ask the question at the podium. Let's go ahead, Andy. Uh, it's a simple question. It's an A or B choice. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, you know, we can all answer it. Um, as uh, Stephen says, a baby can answer this question. A baby can answer the <laughs> so, question. Uh, there's no context to your answer. It's you're going to be given a choice, so you can think in your noggin what the context of the answer is. But keep it inside and just say the answer. Okay. And the question is Andy or Steven? I'm going to go with Andy. And there it is. Mm. Go with Steven then. Oh, <laughs> the, the consolation pick. I'll we, take it. No, I think Steven, to yeah. avoid this, we got to do like a final Jeopardy, like write your answer down kind of a thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you said Texas. Cool. <laughs> All right. You did it. Speaking of doing it, we did the show. Uh, this was, it, this was awesome. Aww. This was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Dual Screens podcast. Uh, if you want to follow us on social media, we're at dual underscore screens. I am at Batchild27. Andy is at Pantsguy. Gentlemen, where could everybody find you and everything that's going on with, with the game? Um, I guess I could go. I'm Billy underscore Basso uh, on Twitter. Um, and then the game is animal underscore well. Uh, you can learn more at animalworld.net. Ooh, you went with a net. Interesting. Interesting yeah, choice. Very get, bold. Get the I think I like net. I think net. Yeah, it's like a network of, yeah. of th- fun animal animals. Wells. It's like you, you didn't <laughs> let not having the dot com be like, you know what? I'm done. It's gonna walk through yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't like change the spelling of, of animal. Like, or I well. will have. It's not like well with a three instead. Like you would like no. I'll just. And if oh, net no, is I, taken, if I changed if I changed oh, no. the spelling of animal. That 
no one would be able to find the game because they would be fucked up forever. <laughs> it would be spell <laughs> spell checking it. Yeah. I'll never get it. Did you mean animal, you idiot? No, I, I meant animal. Like a y, like <laughs> <laughs> Dan, where can everybody find you? Um, also on Twitter, Dan underscore Edelman. Um, also, um, just a reminder to people that you can wish list Animal Well on either PlayStation mm -hmm. 5 or on Steam, so you can go there. We also have a Discord. Ooh. I don't know a convenient way just to say, like, here's our Discord. We're going to put it, the link in the description that of the show. That would be great. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, put we'll it give in you there. all that. Um, so, yeah, join our Discord um yeah i think a lot of people are already kind of starting to speculate about what kind of puzzles may be hidden in there and like you know from uh billy's blog post talking about like it's going to take the whole community to collaborate to think of things like i think that community we only just started the discord uh recently but it's 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 starting to come together and form a community so this is a a good time to like kind of get into that community early and then, you know, by the time the game releases, I think, you know, you know, the, the hunt is on for all those secrets. Very exciting. Yeah. So make sure you join that discord. And of course, folks, you could join our discord by supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash NDS podcast, just like our Patreon producers, Colton, the apprentice Nestler and FNH Paul. We cannot continue to grow without all of your support. So if you do that, not only do you get into our discord, you get all sorts of bonus content. We put something up all the freaking time. You even get these episodes early uh, as we record them. You can get, you know, we'll just put them out there. So you get those as well. So thank you so much for doing that. Again, that's patreon.com slash NDS podcast. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, listeners. And as always, please be excellent to each other. <laughs>